The Theory of the Leisure Class, by Thorstein Veblen, published in 1899, offers a critical examination of consumerism and conspicuous consumption perpetuated by the wealthy leisure class in America during the Industrial Era. Deblin argues that economics must encompass sociological analysis to comprehensively understand a society's consumption patterns and their cultural and economic consequences. Despite its serious socioeconomic focus, Deblin's writing is often laced with satire, revealing his disdain for the leisure class. The book, which received acclaim in its time, remarkably predicted many issues related to American consumerism in the 20th and 21st centuries. It consists of 14 titled chapters. The first chapter serves as an introduction and offers a historical overview of human socioeconomic development. Deblin traces the evolution of society from a peaceful savage stage, marked by cooperation, to a barbaric era characterized by violence, economic development, and competition. He extends these ideas to the modern industrial period, emphasizing that increased wealth has led to greater social stratification, driven by competitive and conspicuous consumption. This chapter establishes the significance of institutions in shaping consumption patterns, foreshadowing the role of sociology in the rest of the book. Chapters 2 to 4 delve into the three central factors driving conspicuous consumption in modern industrial culture. Chapter 2 discusses pecuniary emulation, the desire of the wealthy to outdo one another to gain social recognition. This desire leads the wealthy to consume not for personal comfort, but to showcase their status through symbolic goods and services. Chapter 3 explores how the leisure class builds respectability based on leisure and non-productive work, and Chapter 4 extends this notion to their consumption patterns. Chapters 5 to 7 illustrate how conspicuous consumption manifests in daily life. Chapter 5 argues that a person's wealth is reflected in their standard of living, where expensive objects and services signify class status. Chapter 6 shows how institutions established by the upper class can distort perceptions of value, making expensive items desirable primarily because they are coveted by the respectable wealthy. Chapter 7 highlights how social customs, such as fashion, serve as symbols of conspicuous consumption. Starting in Chapter 8, Deblin's tone shifts towards criticism and satire. Chapter 8 argues that the leisure class, exempt from industrial work, values tradition and conservatism. Chapter 9 supports this point by showing that joining the leisure class in modern industrial society depends on adhering to archaic social structures and customs. Deblin also discusses peaceable and predatory attributes in the context of European ethnic types. Chapter 10 contends that pecuniary culture and consumerism promote competitiveness and ferocity, which, while increasing wealth, are detrimental to society. Chapter 11 explores how religious and superstitious beliefs encourage destructive consumer behaviors, particularly in the context of sports. Chapters 12 to 14 further analyze conspicuous consumption in modern society. Chapter 12 draws parallels between the clerical system and the leisure class, especially in their engagement in conspicuous consumption. Chapter 13 links upper-class women to the clergy, both serving as symbols of vicarious wealth reflecting the respectability of their patriarchal masters. Chapter 14 critiques modern institutions of higher learning for retaining wasteful religious practices, particularly in the humanities field. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.